if you haven't seen any of my Kent Hovind videos yet, you don't have to see any of the previous ones to understand what's happening in this one. I'm going through it piece by piece and splitting it up. So if you haven't seen part one or two or three, you can watch this without seeing the others first. So with all that being said, why don't we listen to Kent Hovind? They will lie to the kids going through these science centers and zoos to make them believe this evolution theory. And there are lies in the textbooks, like 60 of them. We cover that on video number four, lies in the textbooks. In Africa, they found perfectly normal human footprints in a layer of ash that had turned to stone. Perfectly normal human footprints. But the footprints were in ash, supposed to be three and three quarter million years old. They studied the footprints and said, wow, these footprints are exactly the same as ours today. Russell Tuttle, University of Chicago, studied the footprints carefully. He went and found a place where people never wear shoes. They never wear shoes, ever. And he studied their footprints. He had them run through the mud, walk through the mud, you know, jog through the mud, trot, skip. He said the footprints of these people that never wear shoes are exactly like the footprints found in Laetoli, Africa. Well, I guess it's a good thing that footprints in Laetoli, Africa or whatever were not used as evidence that evolution is real, right? Identical. And then he said, if the Laetoli footprints were not known to be so old, we would conclude they were made by a member of our own genus. In other words, if we didn't know better, we would think a human made these. But we do know better, first of all. And second, we don't need this to verify that evolution is a fact. Like I said, Kent Hovind needs to disprove this for his ideas to be true. We do not need to prove it for ours to be true. Well, how do you know better? Oh, because the rock is too old. This is an example of where the evolution theory is a hindrance to common sense and to scientific research. It's one of the greatest hindrances to science. It's not part of science. It's counterproductive to science. Then National Geographic put human ape... Wow, I'm surprised he didn't do the little joke. The National Pornographic joke. Okay. Human ape-like mixture features on these uh, creatures walking through this ash. Now, keep in mind, not one bone was found. No bones are found. If you find perfectly normal human footprints, what would justify you putting dark-skinned, ape-like creatures walking there on your drawing? And if I was African... Uh, because you're an artist and you like drawing things? African American, I'd get upset that they always use dark skin on the missing links. Yeah, I, you know what? <clears throat> Let's see. Footprints in the Ashes of Time, Mary Leakey, National Geographic, April 1979. Let's see if we can look that one up. National Geographic... 1979, page 446. Wow, that's a long issue of National Geographic. Is it just me, or does it seem like this isn't real based on how many pages are in this issue of National Geographic? It's a magazine, isn't it? How did you get to page 446? You know what? I'm not discounting it based on the page number. Let's see if we can find it. Um, National Geographic... How to access digital editions. Oh, shoot. You need a digital account. Shoot, I don't think I can access. I was really hoping I'd be able to look this source up. Uh, well, it looks like I can't really access. Uh, I, I, I'm having trouble finding the issue that he's referencing here because it's so old. Um, I, I did look for it, but the fact that page 446 to 457 is in here at all makes me... Very suspicious. Very suspicious. Uh, I, I just think it's kind of strange that a magazine would have 500 pages in it, practically. That's weird, right? Is it just me? Now, let's, let's just step back a little more and listen again. Putting dark-skinned, ape-like creature. Nope, I wanted to hear that part. My not one bone was... Well, Geographic put human ape-like human ape mixture features on these uh, creatures walking through this ash. Now, keep in mind, not one bone was found. No bones are found. If you find perfectly normal human footprints, what would justify you putting dark-skinned, ape-like creatures walking there on your drawing? And if I was African-American, I'd get upset that they always use dark skin on the missing links. Like there's some kind of, you know, darker skin is less evolved. <laughs> That's what they're... Dude, that is absolutely terrible. Come on, Kent. Pull it together, man. This is ridiculous. This is absolutely too much. Uh, if they came, we came out of Africa as a species. That's just a fact. We came out of Africa. And as a result, 
a lot of our skin was darker as we were evolving because we needed protection from the sun because it was so incredibly hot. And to imply here. And why did they add this toe separation? Notice the big toe is separated away from the... Dude, I think he's reading into this a little bit. Uh, that, that toe separation isn't in there in any of the other footprints. And again, I don't know that this guy didn't just completely... I don't know that he didn't get some one of his artists to draw this, honestly. He has lost all all credibility with me at this point. I do not trust a single word out of this guy's mouth. I do not trust his motives. I don't trust anything about what he has to say here. So I, I honestly would not be surprised if he had one of his artists draw this picture. But either way, um, I think he's splitting hairs a little bit here. None of the other footprints have that toe separation. I think that's just a little anomaly in the art. Oh. Uh, that's what they're trying to imply here. And why did they add this toe separation? Notice the big toe is separated away from the rest of them on the picture. They did it on purpose because it's a real serious problem going from an ape-like foot to a human foot. Apes have a toe that sticks off to the side like a thumb. Uh, that's interesting. Um, th modern apes have something like that, I think. Hang on, let me see. Yeah. Modern apes have that stuff. We didn't evolve from modern apes. We evolved together. It was co-evolution, and then we split off from the same ancestor. That's how this happened. Uh, so it really isn't a problem that they have, like, this thumb type of deal that split off or whatever. It's really not. He just wants to manipulate his audience and make them think that evolution is more pro problematic than it is. It's not. There are interesting questions in evolution that we have. There are interesting questions put forth by people. For example, why are baby kittens cuter than baby humans? Why is that? That's an interesting question. You would think baby kittens would be considered, I'm sorry, you would think baby humans would be considered cuter than baby kittens. Uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, it would benefit the human race more for us to view our own children as way, way cuter, or the cutest thing in existence, right? That's an interesting question. But Kent isn't even considering questions like that because he doesn't go far enough into understanding what evolution is and how it works to even ask questions like that. He just asks ridiculous, obnoxious questions that point out how poorly an understanding of evolution he really has. I can grab a, tr a tree branch and hang by their back feet. You can't do that, okay? If you want to practice it, I'd suggest you start on a low branch for practice, okay? Because <laughs> you're gonna hurt your head. But here they have four million years of bipedalism, and they gave every one of these so-called missing links human feet. Because the foot is a serious problem for the evolutionist. It really isn't a quote-unquote serious problem for anybody. He wants his audience to think it's a serious problem. It's not. Charles Oxnard studied Lucy and said the bones of Lucy represent an animal that is not in the line of humans. It's not a missing link. He did a computer multi... The term missing link in itself is ridiculous. We shouldn't even be using that term. It's not a missing link. He did a computer multivariant analysis of the bones, okay? There could be these creatures, the little ape-like creatures that walk upright, still alive in Sumatra today. Lucy may represent an animal that is still alive. Okay, well, if you're going to make that claim, then you have to back it up with something. What is this? Creation ex nihilo magazine, March to May? Why would I be reading a creationist magazine as a source? This is so incredibly ridiculous that he encourages people to even bother reading this stuff. Lucy may represent an animal that is still alive. Peking man was used for years as evidence for evolution. Everything disappeared. No, it wasn't. We don't need cavemen to prove evolution during world war ii but they found a cave with a bunch of crushed monkey skulls in there the skull had been smashed and they found a bunch of human tools and so some brilliant scientist said wow these monkeys are learning to make tools oh and they're practicing on their head yeah <laughs> that's a good one let's keep that one right over here well duh they didn't tell anybody they found 10 normal humans in the same cave yeah, I don't believe him. There's no source on this one either. Um, 
Yeah, I, I'm sorry, Ken. I, you've just lost all credibility with me. I don't know what you're talking about with Peking Man, but once again, we don't even need Peking Man to prove evolution. Skeletons of humans. See, in some cultures, they like to eat monkey brains. You ever seen Indiana Jones? Mm -hmm. They just found a cave where they were eating monkeys. That's where they had their feasts or something. God, I love how absolutely ridiculous this dude is. Uh, I love how he absolutely insists that all of his conspiracy theories are facts and everyone else is lying. I'm missing link. Homo erectus is still in the textbooks. Homo erectus used to be called Java man, then they changed it to Pithecanthropus erectus and now called Homo erectus. It was found by Dr. Dubois, a Dutch anatomist who went to Indonesia <laughs> purposely to try to find missing links. He hired a bunch of prison convicts to go dig for him. He wasn't even there when they found it. What they found was an ape's skull cap, three human teeth, and a thigh bone found a year later, 50 feet away. Oh, well, let's look at this source. Dubois had no... F okay, so where the source is supposed to go, it says Dubois had no formal training in geology or paleontology at the time, and his archaeological team consisted of prison convicts with two army corporals as supervisors. So it's just... It looks like it's a footnote, kind of, but there's no like footnote marker on here anywhere and there's no source where is the source all of this stuff has been proven without a shadow of a doubt but he needs to disprove this stuff because its mere existence destroys his creationist ideas and a thigh bone found a year later 50 feet away du Bois, du Bois put them all together and said we have a missing link here you don't even know those animal bones go together Three teeth, thigh bone, and a skull cap from an ape. Love it. Uh, called them animal bones in the first place, yeah. This was also going to be used in 1925 as evidence for evolution at the Scopes Monkey Trial. The Java Man. The famous anatomist uh, Virchow said, In my opinion, this creature is, a, is an animal, a giant gibbon. In fact, the thigh bone has not the slightest connection with the skull. Dubois hid the fact that he found two human skulls in the same area. He put those under his bed under the floor. <clears throat> like Edgar Allan Poe, you know, Telltale Heart. Only this was Telltale Head. But there's no evidence of how man evolved at all. So Edgar Allan Poe, shout out, baby. Beautiful. I love it. In my opinion, this creature is, a, is an animal, a giant gibbon. In fact, the thigh bone has not the slightest connection with the skull. Dubois hid the fact that he found two human skulls in the same area. He put those under his bed under the floor. Like Edgar Allan Poe, you know, Telltale Heart, only this was Telltale Head. But... Now let's, let's just take a quick look at the... Uh, who once been Haeckel's professor and is regarded as the father of modern pathology, said, I'm, in my opinion, this creature was an animal, a giant gibbon. In fact, the thigh bone was, has not the slightest connection with the skull. Wow, fascinating. Uh, once again, no source on this either. Dude isn't making... Uh, dude is not providing any sources. Like, why even bother putting this in here and expecting us to believe it if you're not going to list a source? I, th just this whole thing from top to bottom, everything about this entire sermon effectively is what it is. Absolutely ridiculous. There's no evidence of how man evolved at all. The evidence for evolution for uh, humans is... Fra Why does it keep skipping around? We're supposed to be watching the whole thing. For some reason, it keeps, like, jumping. ...of how man evolved at all. The evidence for evolution for uh, humans is fragmentary. Fossil evidence of chimpanzee evolution is absent altogether. There is no evidence of how chimpanzees evolved. But yet you have articles in the magazines all the time, you know, about evolution. Where are we going? I can tell you that. You're going straight to hell if you don't accept Christ. You can accept Christ and also accept evolution uh, simultaneously. That is possible. And it's honestly a damn shame that Kent Hovind is trying to draw this. Uh, he's trying to create like a battle between the two. Like you, you can't accept evolution and also believe in God simultaneously. It's a shame. I hate that he's trying to draw this battle line. Real simple, that's a no-brainer. In Skull, they were gonna have a big display of the Orc Man, Ors, O-R, 
CE, the Orse Man. They were going to put the, have a big you know, a party for the Orse Man they discovered until they discovered it's actually a piece of a skull fragment from a donkey four months old. Well, once again, let's see. Ass taken for man. Daily Telegraph, 1984. Again, why is he using a, a source that's 20 years old at the time? Let's look it up. Daily Telegraph, May 14th, 1984. Oops. I'm not seeing this anywhere. I just typed in the name of the, the supposed name of the article, Ass Taken for Man, and the, the, like the name of the thing. Yeah, accident design, Orse Man debunked. This is a Tumblr post, so not taking that one. Evolutionfacts.com. Orse Man, BritishIsrael.ca. Yeah, I'm not seeing this source anywhere. Um, nothing. I mean, I see a bunch of creationist books written that use this source, but that's about it. And I see a Tumblr post about it. Yeah, nothing. I mean, I'm not... I have no idea where this source came from or why Kent decided to quote it or, or whatever else. Like, it makes no sense whatsoever. I, I don't know anything about this donkey skull fragment. That was going to be the missing link. A dolphin's rib had been labeled as human. Again, we don't need a missing link. We have a billion links between humans and apes. We are the fifth great ape. We have a billion links to prove that this is true. There's no such thing as a missing link, Ken. Human collarbone in the museum for a long time. So somebody said, oh, that's a dolphin's rib. That's not a human collarbone. The hobbit was just found here in 19, uh, 2004. The hobbit was a little bitty, tiny human. Probably a result of uh, secondary microcephaly dwarfism. Just a normal human, about three and a half feet tall. There are people like that today running around the planet. Okay. There's a good book on the so-called cavemen, if you want to read this. If you're being taught this in school, get the book by Marvin Lubinow, Bones of Contention. X. Oh, my God. Now he's going to have all of his, you know, Christian parents buy this book for the kid, and the kid's going to read the book and take it as evidence and take it as fact, and they're going to go in and they're going to cause all kinds of problems for the class. Honestly, embarrassing. One book. It'll really put everything into perspective for you. The only missing link I can find is up between these guys' ears. You know, something is missing. Somebody's professors spend all their free time digging in the dirt looking for bones. My dog does. Uh, not free time. They're actually being paid. That's called an archaeologist. People do that kind of thing. That's, this is a real job that people are paid to do by universities and stuff like that, like research professors. They go around and do this kind of thing. Yeah, because we want to understand history. We want to understand science and all of this other stuff. It's the same thing. <clears throat> but we don't make the taxpayers pay his salary while he does it, okay? Uh, you think the government is sending people out to do this? No, it's research from universities. Although a lot of these universities are subsidized by the government because it's for education purposes. So yeah, I, I, I suppose I can let you have that one to some degree. But it's not... See... Kent is trying to get these people outraged about the fact that people accept evolution as the fact that it is. That's the whole point here. Now, most states have laws requiring textbooks to be accurate. Florida has one. California has one. Texas has one. Wisconsin has one. Alabama has one. The law says textbooks should be accurate. Minnesota says teachers shall not deliberately suppress or distort subject matter. But Minnesota textbooks are still teaching all these as evidence for evolution. No, they're not teaching them as evidence for evolution. They're just teaching that we've discovered these, you know, these ancient humans or these uh, various versions of the Homo sapiens or Homo species. <clears throat> they're not evidence for evolution. Because we understand the subject well. Just because you don't understand it well, Kent, doesn't mean it shouldn't be taught in textbooks. When they, all the ones in the red circle have been proven, they cannot possibly be a missing link. When Kent Hovind complains about taxes, absolutely, yeah. Good point there. I, I appreciate that. That's a good point. Uh, Kent Hovind famously didn't pay taxes for 30 years. Not once in his entire life did he ever pay taxes up until very, very recently. I think when he got out of jail for 10 years for tax evasion. By the way, the Minnesota textbook 
in most textbooks now, instead of calling man homo sapien, like we used to be called, they're now called homo sapien sapien. Yeah. Uh, I think that means something like being aware that you're aware, basically, is what, is what, the, uh, is what that translates to roughly. Uh, what's he going to complain about now? Called, they're now called Homo sapien sapien. Wow, what's that mean? Well, sapien means wise. So we're the wise, wise man. Let's see. It's a Latin word meaning wise. The word sapien is most commonly recognized when used in conjunction with the word homo, an ancient Greek word meaning same or man. Used together, written as Homo sapien, it describes a species of man or human being. Uh, now let's look at the etymology. The genus of human beings in 1802 in William Turton's translation of Linnaeus, coined in modern Latin from Latin homo, meaning man, technically male human, but in logical and scholastic writing, human being. See homunculus plus sapiens, present, uh, present participle of sapier, be wise, see sapient. Interesting. I think sapient technically means knowledge, intelligence, understanding, wisdom, that kind of thing. Uh, that's really what the word means. So it, a, a more faithful translation would probably be knowing that we know, I believe. That's my understanding of it, but take that with a grain of salt. Homo sapiens sapiens is a subspecies that stems from Homo sapiens. This subspecies consists of only modern humans. Homo sapiens sapiens is a scientific name for humans. Hold on, I'm just looking this up because I want to get this right, make sure it's accurate because he's about to criticize it, so I want to know. H. S. sapiens is thought to have evolved sometime between 160,000 and 90,000 years ago in Africa. Okay, so Homo sapiens sapiens is the modern Homo sapiens, basically. It's the modern human, and it's like, you know, within 100,000 years or so is when it, when it started. When that, uh, what do you call it? When that line started, basically. All right. Lay it on me, Kent. What's your complaint? See, the Bible says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And if you think... It's just a naming classification. It's just a naming classification. Nothing more. Sapien, like we used to be called. They're now called Homo sapiens sapien. Wow. What's that mean? Well, sapien means wise. So we're the wise, wise man. See, the Bible says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Well, compared to other, you know, creatures on the planet, we are capable of naming ourselves and classifying ourselves with complex words and complex concepts and stuff like that. So compared to the other animals, it makes sense to name us wise. Absolutely. And if you say otherwise, you're a fool. <laughs> And if you think your grandpa swung by his tail from a tree, you're a fool. Plain and simple, okay? This textbook says he's the daddy of us all. Oh, that's silly. You don't know he's the daddy of anybody. Uh, okay, interesting. This is silly. They don't know that he's the daddy of anybody. God, for some reason, the word daddy really makes me cringe. I don't know why. Anyway, uh, that's true. That's true. We don't know that this person fathered any children specifically. However... We do know that he was a he was from a different line, from an earlier line. That's the point here. Daily Mail, June 12, 2003. Well, you know, I'm not going to check this source because it's very possible the Daily Mail really did write this. Uh, the Daily Mail is absolutely terrible. Absolutely terrible in every way. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the jokes here. The Wi-Fi went down during family dinner tonight. A kid started talking, and I didn't know who it was. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the canned laugh is great, right? I love it to death. I think that's so funny. Anyway, okay, let's continue with um, Hovind and Mario Maker. Yeah, the Daily Mail is absolutely terrible, and it truly does not. It wouldn't surprise me to find that they did say this, but I just want to point out there's no article name. There's no nothing here. What, what are they even talking about? What is he quoting? You can't just 
quote something and then say, like, CNN said this. You have to get a little more specific than that. You find bones in the dirt. You don't know it's the daddy of anybody. It's just the mother of all mammals from the Smithsonian. Yeah, the problem is, you know, you don't have, you have the flimsiest understanding of evolution. That's the, that's the issue here, Kent. If you understood how evolution works, it would be obvious what was intended or what was meant by that in the first place. If you find bones, you don't know it's the mother of anything. See, if you find fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. You couldn't prove it had any kids, and you sure couldn't prove it had different kids. You know, I understand this argument may work on people who don't understand evolution fully, so let me just explain. Nobody is saying that this person was literally the parent of everybody. Nobody made that claim. Nobody would make that claim. Modern humans came from this population. We can tell that they came from this population. We can tell they came from this population through various scientific means. It doesn't mean that this specific individual gave birth to anybody or any of that stuff. It's not what anyone is saying. You couldn't prove it had any kids, and you sure couldn't prove it had different kids. Nobody said that. Nobody's trying to prove that. You're just twisting evolution around. They're not understanding it or both. And why would you think a bone you found in the dirt can do something animals today cannot do, which is produce something other than their kind? No. Now, we know for a fact that genetic mutations do happen when babies are born. They do. I, I don't remember exactly how. I think on average it was 70 genetic mutations that are brand new per generation in humans, I believe. Uh, it's been a while since I looked this up, so take that with a grain of salt. The last time I looked it up, I think that's, I think that's what I found. Kent Hovind needs genetic mutations to basically never happen, which is weird because the guy already admitted to accepting quote-unquote microevolution. All you need is microevolution and time, and suddenly you are exactly where I am with everything fossil would count as evidence in a court of law, as evidence for evolution in a court of law. So where does a stone age fit into the Bible? Was there ever a stone age? Well, right after the flood, Noah couldn't tell his grandson to go to the hardware store and get him a shovel. There were no hardware stores. Yeah, good point. So how did Noah build an ark with no saws, no shovels, no nails, no hammers, no nothing? Uh, is he about to address this? I'd love it if he would. They had a devastated society, folks. They got off the ark and everything outside is destroyed. You have to totally rebuild civilization. They had a Gilligan's Island situation. You got a bunch of smart people. Well, Gilligan's Island did not have a bunch of smart people. You know, maybe one. But they're on this d devastated planet. So they're going to have to rebuild from scratch and you're going to make stone tools because that's much quicker than digging the iron ore out, smelting it down, and making an iron tool. You know, by the time it takes you three weeks to make your ax, you're going to starve to death, okay? So they're going to make stone tools. And people that are driven out of society are going to travel around in small herds and packs following, uh, following uh, migrating animals. Dude, I love it how he's depicting, like, if you look here, look at how he's, look at how he's depicting this. He's, he's depicting this like once the boat landed, he just opened it up and let everybody out. Just go. Go on. How did he prevent the only two lions from eating the only two zebras? How did he prevent the only two anteaters from eating all of the ants? I mean, nothing about this story makes sense, and his depiction of it here makes it even more ridiculous. Seriously. But, you know, that's not even the point of what he's saying. Let's, let, let's keep listening. ...and packs following, uh, following uh, migrating animals, and they don't want to carry 50 pounds worth of stone tools with them. It's quicker to make your stone tools on the job site. You follow the mammoths until you catch up with them or the buffalo, and then you quick make your tools, kill the buffalo or the mammoth, and you butcher it and leave your tools behind and go on someplace else. And then we today find these stone tools and say, wow, look at this Clovis point. Wow, perfectly shaped, perfectly balanced. This guy is smart. This is an advanced civilization. And then they find another arrowhead, arrowhead that looks kind of crude, you know, it's not chipped very smoothly. And they say, wow, this guy's pre-human. You're not quite as smart. 
Yeah, I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, I agree many cultures today make and use stone tools. That's not a surprise. That's not contrary to science or any of that. Like, what what are you trying to get at here, Ken? Well, I don't understand. Yes, stone tools are common throughout, like, human history and, and even currently common. Like, this happens from time to time. What's the point? He's trying to, like, disprove the existence of a Stone Age. You know, maybe you got the whole wrong perspective on that. Maybe the one that looks kind of crude was found by a guy who's in a bigger hurry because the mammoth is getting away, okay? He just doesn't have time to sit there and play with his arrowhead for an hour. Yeah, this is a bizarre depiction. They didn't chase the mammoth and make a stone, like, make a stone thing while chasing the mammoth. What are you talking about, dude? While they're running? Like, they're, they're chipping away at, like, a stone arrowhead while they're running toward this mammoth or whatever? What? Why do you think that? Like, how did you come to that conclusion? What a bizarre thing to think. They would make this stuff before they went out hunting in preparation for it, and then they would kill it. And no, they wouldn't just leave it out there. They would take it with them if they could, because they don't want to sit there and make more. Have time to sit there and play with his arrowhead for an hour. He wants to go shoot the thing now before it runs off. Yeah, that would that's an interesting idea, except for the fact that we can find it in different layers of rock. So there are different layers of rock, the geologic column, which he absolutely hates, by the by. Uh, there are different layers that we can go through and find different qualities of arrowheads different types of animals. If we found a if we found rabbit bones in the Precambrian era of the geologic column, that would disprove evolution. Or at least it would at least refute it. Re, uh, it would at least refute it. We have never found that before, never. Anywhere in the entire world have we ever found an animal uh, or an animal skeleton in the wrong part of the geologic column. We find these arrowheads and stuff like this in the correct parts, as we would expect, of varying quality going through the generations or going through the different eras. We find it all the time. So it might be an example of how much time they have to spend on it, not at all an example of their intelligence. Yeah, that would make sense if we hadn't found them in different layers of the geologic column. But not only were people living longer before the flood, animals were too, and they were growing bigger, probably much bigger. Here's a hornless rhinoceros, 18 feet tall. That's a big rhino. People say, that's a prehistoric animal. No, did you know the word prehistoric was not even in the dictionary until about 100 years ago? We collect old... Okay, I'm suspicious of this claim. I don't know that this is true, but okay, for the sake of argument, let's go along with it. Dictionaries in our science center. If you have some old dictionaries from 17 or 1800s, we'd love to get them. I got a dictionary from 1766. The word prehistoric was not there. I got a dictionary from 1860. The word prehistoric is not there. No such. Again, I, I'm suspicious of anything that Ken Tobin says. I. I it seems like an innocuous claim. It seems like it, it doesn't really matter that much. I'm just saying I do not trust the guy one bit. Thing as prehistoric back in 1860. Here's a dictionary from 1892. The word prehistoric is still not there. See, there are things that are pre-flood, but there's no such thing as prehistoric. We have history from the first day. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You can't go before that. So there's no such thing as prehistoric. But before the flood came, this canopy of water would increase air pressure, which would make things behave very differently. It makes insects grow much bigger. See, insects are limited on size by based on the amount of oxygen they can get. Insects that live in oxygen-rich waters get a thousand times heavier than those that don't. Is that a true claim or is that a false claim? Let's see. Bugs growing in oxygen-rich waters grow up to a thousand times heavier than those living off Europe? living off Europe. What does that mean, first of all? I guess he's showing his source in the picture here. BBC News, Thursday, May 13th, 1999, published at 1659 GMT. Okay, let's see. Oxygen boosts polar giants. BBC News. 
see if it's a real source. I, I'm not saying it's, or I'm not even looking up if it's a real claim or not, if it has any factual basis to it. I'm just trying to find out if he lied about this and made a fake source again. Let's just look it up. Okay. Uh, let, looks like news.bbc.co.uk does have this picture, but what is it? What does it say exactly? Some animals living near the poles become supersized monsters compared to their lower latitude cousins, and now scientists know why they have more oxygen to breathe. This is from 1999. Now let's check and see if this claim is actually real or if it's completely fabricated. Big insects provide big answers about oxygen. This is a reasonably trustworthy source. How does an animal's environment affect its evolution? John Vandenbrooks is exploring the question in dragonflies and other insects by manipulating their oxygen levels. This is from 2013. Giant insects are something that would terrify any rational human being. Fortunately, such things only exist in the realms of science fiction and horror, right? Actually, no. Apparently, John Vanderbrooks, a postdoctoral research associate in ASU's School of Life Sciences, has raised dragonflies that were 15% larger than normal size. But why would someone want to bring supersized bugs into the world? 15% larger. Okay, that's not twice as big or four times as big or a thousand times heavier like he claimed here. 15% larger is very different. And you have to increase the oxygen levels to 31% from 21%. So this is like an ancient atmosphere level. Uh, if you give it an ancient atmosphere level, you end up with bugs that are about 15% larger. Not a thousand times heavier. It has to do with the surface area to volume ratio. Without boring everybody for a half hour, the larger an insect gets, it has more skin, but not compared to its volume. The surface area compared to its volume ratio drops off, as you can see on the chart here. So as an insect gets larger, it can't, doesn't have enough skin because insects breathe through their skin. But giant insect fossils have been found, like this dragonfly with a 50-inch wingspan. How'd you like to hit one of those at 70 miles an hour? <laughs> you take the bug deflector and the hood right off and join you in the front seat. Big dragonflies been found fossilized on this planet. Today they get four or five inches long, you know, not very big. Pre-flood, they were huge. Cockroaches get pretty good size today. We raise them in our museum in Pensacola, the Madagascar hissing cockroaches. But Oh, please, no. God, those are the worst. You know, giant cockroaches have been found, 18-inch long cockroach. Please, no. Uh, again, I don't trust anything Ken Tovin says. I don't. Uh, I'm skeptical of every claim, no matter how innocuous. But, oh my God, please, no, not 18-inch cockroaches. Fossils. <laughs> you didn't call Orkin in those days. You called the National Guard to come exterminate the house, okay? Giant fossil centipede, eight and a half feet long, was found. Grasshoppers, two feet long, have been found fossilized. You can make a meal out of those. Yeah, I mean, the bugs were bigger at, at certain periods of time in history. That's true. I'm, I'm not sure what he's trying to get at here. I mean, I've already disproved his oxygen hypothesis or whatever that, you know, humans breathe more oxygen, 10% more oxygen or whatever, and suddenly they grow to 35 feet tall. That's absolutely ridiculous. By the way, it would be impossible for a warm-blooded creature to be a certain size. Uh, it would cook itself from the inside, if it were. So a lot of his claims are physiologically impossible. Just want to put that on record. That's why dinosaurs were... I don't think dinosaurs were cold-blooded or warm-blooded. I believe they were a mix. Uh, temperature regulation is very, very important in certain creatures of, of certain sizes. So, Tarantula with a three-foot leg span, fossil. 60-foot cattail fossils have been found. A donkey nine feet high, from Texas, of course. Everything's bigger in Texas, okay? Giant sloths obviously lived on the planet. Now, you're going to be told that was millions of years ago. No, it wasn't. It was just before the flood came. Buff yeah, I'm going to need a little evidence for that claim, Kent. 
uh, out of curiosity, when did giant sloths are exclusively responsible for the avocado existing? They were seed carriers and they would eat avocados. And the seed was gigantic in the avocado because it would pass through the digestive system of the giant sloths. And, you know, the sloth would carry it off to somewhere else and drop it somewhere. And boom, new avocado tree, just like that with fertilizer mixed in and everything. It's perfect. And they e kind of co-evolved. Uh, it says here that the giant sloth went extinct 11,000 years ago. That's not even really that long ago uh, in the grand scheme of things. So what was it that Kenthoven said here about them? Giant sloths obviously lived on the planet. Now you're going to be told that was millions of years ago. No, it wasn't. It was just before the flood came. No, it was 11,000 years ago, give or take, when they went extinct. Now, I don't know when they actually appeared or when they, you know, the, when they originally evolved or whatever. But yeah, it was about 11,000 years ago when they went extinct. Buffalo were found with horn spans up to 12 feet. Elk with 12-foot antlers. Some of you deer hunters are thinking, wow. That'll look good on the wall. How many of you go out and try to shoot Bambi's daddy? Come on, be honest, okay? There we go. Good, good. And eat them too. You know, fossil kangaroos have been found 10 feet tall. And fossil wombat, the size of a mini. The size of a mini what? <laughs> uh, a, a mini coop? A mini, I mean, a, a mini van? What? I don't know. Uh, I'm skeptical of all of his claims, like I said. I mean, I, I don't really know what he's trying to get at here, but okay. I thought they needed a bunch of oxygen, Kent. What happened to your claims about oxygen before? Here's a fossil of a guinea pig that was 1,500 pounds. That's a big guinea pig. Birds have been found 13 feet tall. Yeah, I think that's an emu, isn't it? Those aren't even that old. Uh, emu are reasonably new. I th are emu extinct now, I believe? When did the emu go extinct? There was actually a war between emu and humans. The species survived in the wild until 1865, and the last captive bird died in 1873. Oh, that's, that's really sad. Yeah, there was an emu war, I believe, in Australia. Emu got up to six feet tall, looks like. So not the 13 feet he's claiming here. But they were pretty tall, for sure. They were definitely pretty tall. Let's keep listening. There's an uh, elephant bird egg. The one behind it's an ostrich egg, which is also huge. <laughs> they find fossils of prehistoric goose that stood as tall as an elephant and weighed half a ton. How would you like to have that for Thanksgiving dinner? Tell Tiny Tim about that goose. <laughs> yeah. You know, we know that there were a lot of very large creatures out there. We know that. I mean, that's not a surprise to anybody. I'm not sure what he's trying to get at here. We, we get it. His problem is that he absolutely insists on claiming that these animals existed recently, in the past four to 6,000 years, and it was a direct result of high levels of oxygen. There is no evidence for that. It's an absolutely ridiculous claim. 